What's up, people? Welcome to this episode of the By the Hood podcast or webcast because I don't know how you're consuming this content. I'm your host as always. My name is Jimmy. And as we start off every show, that's with gratitude. Just want to say thank you to all of our supporters, anyone who watches any of our content, who follows our movement. Um, we appreciate all of it. I want to give a special shout out, right? It's hoodie season. So I have this hoodie right here. The hoodie is entitled, it says deeds and dividends are greater than debt, which is interesting for this episode. But um, we noticed that since it's hoodie season, a lot of people have been purchasing hoodies and I want to say thank you to all you guys. Um, you know, my partner, Corey, is not with me today. He's actually traveling back from Philadelphia. He bought a piece of land in Texas, so he's getting ready to start building out there. But I'm holding down the fort nonetheless. And we have a very, very special episode because um, I mentioned debt, right? So it's an interesting conversation that we have on our platform. So we have a couple here who's doing amazing things and they're helping people get uh, you know, free. And we like to highlight people who are doing amazing work, right? So I'm tell you a little bit about them, right? They help millennials become debt free. They paid off over two hundred and twenty four thousand dollars in two and a half years. The founders of the Debt Slayers Boot Camp, and they also have a book out called Got Debt. Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce you guys. That's Faith and Leo. Jean Louise, how are you guys? We're great. We're great. Thanks for having yeah, us. Excited to be here. Excited to Absolutely, have you. absolutely. And I want to talk about like, you know, you got your guys' message and um everything that you got going on because I think it's a very important message. Um, but before we get into that, can you guys tell me a little bit about your background? I guess individually, where are you from? What part of the country are you from? And you know, how was your upbringing? Yeah, so my name is Faith and I am from Chicago, Illinois. Um, I actually, well, right now we live in Atlanta. So I moved here in Atlanta to Atlanta about six years ago or so. I am a nurse practitioner and that's why I actually came to Atlanta to go to nursing school here. Um, my upbringing actually was really nice. I mean, my parents both worked really hard. They worked five days a week. And honestly, I got everything that I ever wanted, everything that I ever needed. You know, I just thought, hey, if I wanted it, my parents would buy it for me. That was just kind of like my life. Um, and a fun fact is that I didn't get my first job until I was like 23 years old. And I actually had to like beg my dad to let me work. He was not trying to work. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, that was kind of like my upbringing is that, you know, for me, if you wanted something, you just kind of got it. And I don't really, I mean, I saw them working hard, but I personally never had to experience that until I got married and got into a bunch of debt, which we'll talk about. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, no, that's amazing. I, you know, um, I, I love to hear that kind of story because um, sometimes in our community, we, we, we tend to like, you know, uh, want to hear the, the struggle stories, but it's amazing to have parents that, you know, um, put you in that position. That's awesome. That's awesome. How about you, Leo? What's your background like? Uh, I am Haitian, 100% Haitian. So I rep that all day. Um, I grew up without a father. Uh, my dad passed away when I was seven. Um, I actually grew up away from my mom as well because she lives in Haiti and she wanted me to have more opportunity here in the States. So I lived with relatives all of my life. And growing up, um, I watched my mom work you know, six days a week for as long as I could remember. And it wasn't until I was older and in debt myself that I come to find out that she was working so hard because she was um, struggling with debt as well. So um, while I emulated her work ethic, um, once I got some common sense, um, I vowed to never be in debt because I saw firsthand the struggles that she had, the amount of stress that she was in. And I remember one conversation I had with her and she literally told me that she doesn't know when she's going to retire um, and she may never retire because she has to pay all of these people back. And that really broke my heart. And um, that made me want to get serious about putting myself in a better position so then I could, you know, help her retire as well. That's one of our goals. And um, but yeah, so we're passionate about debt freedom because we see all of the roadblocks, all of the obstacles that it causes, all of the stress that it causes in people's lives. And so um, the first step was for us to become debt free. And then the next step is to help others. Yeah. Yeah, man. That's awesome. That's, 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 that's interesting how debt has uh, had an impact on your life even before you became adults. Um, let's talk about that. Did either of you go to college student loans part of it or, or what, how did you guys rack up the debt that you accumulated? Was it just credit cards or did you guys go yeah. to school? What was it? And so it was a lot of student loans. Yeah. Um, 
like I said, so I first got my degree in Wisconsin, a biochemistry degree. So that was a lot of student loans. And then I was like, oh, I want to be a nurse. So then I went to nursing school and racked up more student loans. So for me, I was bringing in a lot of student loans. I don't even know yeah, how it much. Was, it was combined. We had, when we said I do, we had $211,000 of debt. And most of it was student loans. We had $198,000 of student loans. So that was, you know, two undergrad degrees, master's degrees, and then the rest were credit cards and personal loans. All right. Uh, student loans made up the bulk of it. You just made a point. I want to talk about this, though. You said when we said I do. So what was the conversation like before you? Did you guys have that debt conversation um, before, like before you got married? Like, how did that go? Like, who brought it up and how did that conversation go? Yeah. So we had conversations about, finances way before we got married. So when we were dating, and that's one of the reasons why um, we started off our marriage on the right foot is because we started having those conversations early on. So to anyone listening, if you're dating, seriously dating someone, we definitely encourage you to have the conversation because Faith, you know, she mentioned she was racking up all this debt. We had no idea how much she owed yeah. when we were dating. <laughs> I had already been working for about two or three years at the time. So I knew how much I owed, but she didn't. Mm -hmm. So one of our conversations was literally uh, sitting down and writing out every single debt that she owed. And by the end of it, she realized that she had $144,000 of um, student loans mm -hmm. at the time. Yeah, And mm -hmm. that was an eye opener for her. And um, I even remember um, when we were dating, she would offer to pay for you know some of our meals. And she wasn't working at the time, so I was like, where are you getting this money from? <laughs> to find out, she had eight thousand dollars sitting in the bank from Sally Mae, just chilling, living her best life. And I actually asked her to give it back. And you know, she was hesitant at first, but she ended up agreeing. But the reason I asked her to give it back, even though we weren't engaged or anything like that, is because we were getting serious, and I knew that eight thousand dollars would have been. Twelve, fifteen thousand dollars by the time we got married, and so we would be having to pay that back once we yeah. got married and started our journey. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, so here's my thing. You, so, how soon into a relationship should someone have this conversation? Like, you, that's not something you bring up on a first date. Like, well, I just want you to know, I got you know, hundred and forty-four thousand dollars of debt. Like, how do you counsel people on that? Like, how soon should they have that conversation? As soon as you're comfortably possible uh, as as soon as you're comfortable enough to you know start talking about the future together then y'all should be talking about where you stand with your finances so um you need to have that talk so mm -hmm. um i encourage people as soon as you're talking about you know where you're moving towards so i think every relationship you should have a vision for it and so if you're talking about moving forward together as a unit then you need to be talking about multiple things including money so there are things that you may not want to bring up you know on a first date um so ease your way into the conversation <laughs> and make sure that you know the the setting is right the context is right make sure you're not judging you know when you're having these conversations um because you know the topic of money um is taboo in our society you know we don't talk about it at work we don't talk about it at home we don't talk about it in the um in the uh schools um and so you know it can be a deep source of shame and embarrassment for many people. So it is a sensitive topic, um, but we do encourage people to at least have a conversation so that you don't end up married and then you're wondering how you all got to where you are. Um, and it's because oftentimes you're not having that conversation. So you didn't know this person, you know, like, you know, a bougie life. And so, and that, <laughs> <laughs> so you're trying to pay off all the debt, but this person likes, you know, all the high end things. Um, yeah, so important to have that conversation, especially, you know, you know how you grew up with money. Like, All right. you know, you know, this, yeah, that kind of stuff. I, I love you guys story. But one of the reasons I wanted to have you on is because like so on our on our Instagram page. Right. Um, we, we like to have a lot of fun. So we'll post memes and different things. But we always try to talk about like serious finance topics. Um, but anytime I post anything about credit card debt or debt, I get a lot of engagement. And a lot of it is. um people talk about what uh, works in theory versus what happens in practice, right? That's the way they put it. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the most recent uh, things I put up, I was talking about people paying for things using credit cards when they actually have the cash. 
Ooh. And I got a lot. I got so many inboxes. And even on the actual post, uh, I got a lot of people. Well, you have to, you know, use it to get the points and you have to do this and you do all the strategy. And I'm giving them data points. I'm like, well, that's not what the data says. The data says that people aren't really taking advantage of points. They're, they're giving the banks money. They're throwing money away. Right. But but and in, in just in my engagement online, um. Everybody, according to everybody I talk to, they pay their credit cards off every month. I'm like, that's not possible. That's not what I read. But all you guys, all you guys claim to do that. So, so when you guys um um go into the marketplace and you try to teach people about these things, do you get the same kind of feedback with um you know uh, people want to tell you all the different strategies, the different point strategies, and travel points, and all those kind of things? Yeah, we get that. You know, every year, once in a while, um, you'll have that person you know who has mastered everything, and and that may be the case for some people. But the reality is, the numbers don't lie. And you know, I think in 2019, uh, the credit card industry was set to collect um, 122 billion dollars in interest alone. And so these are people who have done their research because the credit card industry is a billion dollar industry and so they're doing uh, research on human behavior and spending behavior and all that stuff so what people fail to realize is that you're not as strong as you think you are right so in theory it may sound good you know to collect the points but this is what you know the industry is doing they're researching your spending habits they're you know researching you know what you're looking at so that they can put advertisements and they know that you're not as strong as you think you are and so what they'll do is they'll say you know we'll offer you 3% cash back. We'll offer you, you know, these certain amount of miles in exchange. We'll, you know, tack on 20% interest. And I don't know about you, but if somebody approached me and said, Hey, I'll give you 3%, 5%. If you give me 15, 16%, which is the average credit card okay. interest rate. I don't think that's a good deal. And so <laughs> you, may, you may be good for, you know, a month or two, but what ends up happening is when, you know, you see that the latest and greatest, um, gadget, you know, the PS5 is coming out, the iPhone's coming out. Uh, you don't have enough willpower to actually wait until you have the money. And so you're going to put it on a credit card because of instant gratification. And so um, that goes as far back as, you know, when, you know, psychologists were doing studies with marshmallows with little kids. And, you know, they would be like, okay, I'll put this marshmallow out here in front of you. If you can wait long enough, I'll come back and give you you know, another marshmallow. Um, and what happened with the kids is that they couldn't muster up enough courage to actually wait to get that second one. They wanted to eat it right away. And I forget the name of the study, but it's the same thing with us. Yep. We want everything right here, right now. We don't, you know, we get into, you know, the habit of, you know, spending a dollar fifty when we only earn a dollar. And that's just a perpetual cycle that we find ourselves in and rack up credit card debt. And we just don't have enough as much willpower as we think we do. And we got to be honest with ourselves when it comes to that. Yeah, that's, that's, that, those are all excellent points because, you know, um, I find those conversations, uh, interesting because I'm like, everybody, you guys all can't be paying off your credit cards, um, every right. month the way you say you do. Like so many <laughs> will be out of business. Yeah. I'm like, that's not what the data says. Like I'm looking right. at facts, like this isn't about feelings and, um, I understand, but the discipline and, um, a lot of times when I talk to people about investing, right? So we'll talk about investing and I'll tell them, before, you know, um, well, what are you paying in your credit cards? And they don't want to hear that. And I'm like, well, if you're paying 29%, I'd rather you pay that off right now before you start investing because you're not going to make 29%. So <laughs> why not pay your debt off first? You know, um, well, you know, I think the, that, the thing is, ahead. paying off debt isn't, isn't fun, right? Mm -hmm. So people don't like to do it because it's not fun. There's like no real fun in, paying some it's it's more fun to just get the item and then worry about it later than it is to actually do the work and so investing you know a lot of people want to get a return and all that all that stuff but they don't want to worry about the debt that they've accrued because they've already got the item so what's the point of hurrying up to pay it back um, yeah sorry. and and the thing is a lot of times um and I, I speak from experience with it. I'll tell you guys a quick story. Um, you know, I, I went to Lincoln University, uh, an HBCU here in Pennsylvania. And um, at the time, I didn't have a job, but and I don't know they still do this, but they used to allow credit card companies on the campus, oh, yeah. and they would oh, put yeah. up their little tables. And um, Discover gave me like ten thousand dollar credit card, and I didn't have a job, and I spent all ten thousand. Wow. But um, <laughs> but at the same time. <laughs> 
<laughs> but at the same time, I, I'm like, first of all, how they even give me a credit card? But that's either here nor there. But the point is, I, I went through that experience. Um, but because of it, I understand how dangerous it is, but also how important it is, and how um how easy it is to build wealth when you don't have to pay those those you know paying for stuff that you bought two years ago. Right. Um, right. You know, and, and what you just said is interesting about it's not fun paying off debt. So I, I was looking on you guys' page, and you and you have that uh that chart you made, right? I guess that kind of like gamifies it a little bit. The uh -huh. little um, let me see, it's the freedom meter you guys have. You guys created yeah. that freedom meter, yeah. So I guess that kind of like helps out the idea of gamifying it. And for those listening or watching, please go to their Instagram page. I'll make sure that I put all their links uh, in the description. But check out their freedom meter because uh, gamifying it is something that helps, right? So. One time I sat down and I recognized that um, you're adding to your net worth, whether you're buying investments or paying off debt. Oh, and yeah. I know that sounds very simple, but when I actually wrote it down, it helped me pay off debt faster. Because right. now I'm like, OK, no matter which side of the column I'm putting in, my actual net worth is increasing. So that's something that helped me personally, which is why when I saw your meter, I said that can definitely be helpful to people. Um, what yeah. has been the feedback of that meter you guys created? I think people have loved it. So we create, well, we, yeah, we created it because I am a visual person. So we would like pay off debt and Leo would be like, oh, yay, we're done with this. Well, we have like 20 more debts, but we're done with this one. And I'd be like, oh, great. Like that just didn't do anything for me. So I needed to physically see the progress. So then we created this freedom meter where basically once you pay off your debt, you like color in the meter so you can see your progress. And that was like a game changer for me. So we posted it like right in the front by our door. And so every single time we pay off a debt, we would like always see that meter gradually going up. And that was very motivating. And so for other people, they have loved it as well. I mean, we get pictures all the time of like people showing us their progress and telling us, man, this is so good. This is so motivating for us to actually see the progress that we're making. Right. And then, you know, what doesn't get measured doesn't get done. And research shows that when not only when you write your goals down, but when you accompany it within with a visual, you're much more likely to accomplish that goal because our brain processes images faster than anything else. Mm -hmm. And so that was a huge motivator for us um, to color in that freedom meter. And Faith got the idea from the building, you know, church the fund. The building fund. The building yeah. fund, yeah. <laughs> so she got that idea from that. We ran with it and we made a lot more progress once we actually had it written down and we can see the progress that we were making um, on paying off our debt. Um, but even going back to what you said about the, you know, the credit card, I don't know if they still do that at campuses. I would hope not. Um, but it's just the reality of the society that we live in um, where, you know, financial illiteracy is profitable. And so we yeah. talked about the credit cards and you not understanding how credit cards work, but debt in general, not understanding how interest works. And so everybody wants to invest, mm -hmm. but then there's the other aspect of it, of negative compounding interest, which is what happens when you owe a whole bunch of money. All of that money is going towards interest that you could be using to build wealth. And so when you know kids sign up for college because it's the thing to do, nobody ever sits down and walks them through, you know, what are the implications for borrowing this much money? Is the degree that you're going um, to pursue um, going to be um, going to be able to cover the amount of debt that you're taking out for it? Yeah. So you find a lot of um, student borrowers who are not even using the degree that they went to school for. And all of that is financial illiteracy. So we talk about not learning at home, not learning it in school. That's part of the system. It's, it's such a profitable business that, of course, they're not going to teach us um, about these things. And so that's where, you know, at some point you have to say enough is enough yeah. and make the necessary changes. And that's what we're doing. That's what we're teaching others to do. Man, amazing. Amazing stuff. Let me ask you guys this, though. So you had the conversations as you were, uh, you know, uh, dating and getting ready to get married. Um, is that when you decided this is going to be like, you know, this is something that we're going to do together, like we're going to pay this? Because you guys paid off over $220,000 in, 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 in a short period of time. Yeah. How did you guys come to that decision? Like, this, we're going to focus on this. Like, we're going to get rid of this in a short period of time. What was that conversation like? So we, well, before we got married, we sat down with our pastors and had premarital counseling. And one of the homework assignments was, what's the vision of your marriage? Like, what do you want to accomplish together? And so we went back, we talked about the vision and kind of what we wanted to do as a couple. 
And we realize that we can't accomplish our vision with all of this debt. Like it's just going to take us way too long to accomplish it. Yeah. And so we were paying like $2,000 in minimum payments. Right. So $2,000 in minimum payments, it would have taken us 15 years to pay off our debt and it would have cost us $125,000 $125,000 in interest, interest along the way on top of that 211 that we right. owe. Yeah. So all of our time would have been spent like working to pay back other yeah, people. Yeah. And so like, there's no way that we would be able to live out our God given purpose by having this hindrance and this, you know, roadblock in front of us. Yeah. And I think seeing that made us realize, all right, we need to do something about this. Like we cannot live our life paying minimum payments of, two thousand dollars like forever so i think that was like the turning point and at that point we're like all right let's do this let's figure out ways that we can get rid of this debt asap yeah and so we didn't even know what how we were going to do it Mm -hmm. what we were going to do how long it was going to take us all we knew is that we couldn't stay in this place and so we just started putting one foot in front of the other and um slowly started to build momentum Mm -hmm. and figured it out along the way And once we shared our story on Instagram, um, people started asking us questions. And so um, it became much bigger than what we want, what we planned planned for it because we were just sharing it for accountability. Um, But yeah. And so um, if anyone doesn't know our story is that in our first year of marriage, we paid off one hundred and four thousand dollars of debt in 12 months. Mm -hmm. And like we did everything under under the sun to just try to get rid of our debt. And, you know, we built up that traction and we never looked back. Interesting. So, like, did you find yourself, um, I, I guess, uh, you know, I, I know there's a high correlation between, say, uh, minimalism, the fire movement and debt reduction. Right. Uh-huh. Um, so what are you guys opinion of the fire movement? Uh, we love the fire movement. So for anyone listening, the fire movement is financially independent or financial independence retire early. So it's this movement uh, where they're uh, challenging the status quo of what it means to retire. So um, they're going against the, you know, the traditional way of retirement, which is, you know, working for 30, 40 years and then retiring at 65. I think now they pushed it back to 67. Um, But they're challenging that by, um, you know, living frugally, uh, minimalism, like you said, increasing their savings rate so that they can remove themselves from the dependence of a job to actually free up their time uh, to spend doing the things that they love, spend it with family members, spend it on um, passion projects or whatever it is. So you don't have to, you know, technically retire, retire, Mm -hmm. um, but you have the option. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we love that movement. Um, I think we need more colored people uh, pursuing that because it Mm -hmm. is possible. If you're going to make minimum payments all of your life, you can build wealth, right? Mm -hmm. So it just, it's a change in mindset and then it's a change in behavior to use that money in your favor um, and use that money to build wealth versus building other people's wealth. So your debt is passive income to somebody else. Why don't you put that toward yourself, you know, and and build wealth for yourself and for your family? Um, And so, yeah, yeah, we're um, passionate about um, becoming financially free. And I think even in the the environment that we're in right now with the pandemic, I think people are realizing that um, they need to put themselves in a better position. And a lot of people are struggling because they have so many bills. So not just like, um, you know, essential bills that you need to pay that everybody pays, but more so like the unnecessary stuff. So, you, just said, you just said something that was very powerful. I had to write that down. Your debt is passive income to somebody else. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, Ooh, yeah. that's a bar right there. I like that one. Um, oh, yeah. That's a word. <laughs> Yeah, that's what people don't realize is that there are two uh, there are two income statements and balance sheets involved when it comes to your debt. So money, you earn an income, that money um, you then use it to, you know, pay purchase liabilities and you pay interest and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. But on the other side of it is are the lending institutions that are collecting that and putting it into their um, income sheet as like passive income. And so that's what's going on on a day-to-day basis. Mm -hmm. So that's why, um, yeah, that's the, that's one of the biggest things standing in the way of people building wealth is all the interest that they're paying on things and interest is making the money that you should be making. And so 
That's yeah. very powerful. That is very powerful right there. One of the things I love about you guys' story is you took something that would, um, many would perceive like, you know, a weakness and you made it your strength, right? So you took something that, you know, um, you wanted to fix. You fixed that. And now you're able to inspire others and, and, and teach others. And I think that right there is just amazing. Um, and the fact that you guys are willing to do that is also amazing. Um, but along this journey, what has been you guys' biggest hurdle? Like something that you've had to overcome uh, that take you from where you were to where you are now? Um, for me, I think the biggest part is realizing that this is going to be a marathon. Like I, it's not going to be something that just like happens overnight. Your behavior changes aren't just going to happen overnight. You're not going to wake up and then all of a sudden be like perfect on your budget. Like, so that was kind of hard for me because I'm like, man, like I'm working so hard. We're paying off all this money to these lending institutions, but like, it's still taking so long. <laughs> so that was part of it for me that I had to get over. And I think still the freedom meter helped with that because then I was able to see, okay, well, we're making progress. So it's just taking a long time, but we're making progress. Another big thing that was really hard that I had to get over is not focusing on what other people are doing. Focus on my mm. life. So I would be on Instagram and I'd be like, man, my friends are traveling. My friends are going out to eat. Everybody's doing all this stuff. But here I am working, paying off debt. <laughs> so that was really important. And to make sure that I always remembered the goal. And so, yeah, it took us two and a half years. And I think back, I don't even remember what those people were doing two and a half years ago. <laughs> so, I mean, it, and it did fly by. So I think it was really important for me to focus on what we were doing, to realize that this is not going to last forever, yeah. um, and to just be consistent and be patient with the process. And how about how about you, Leo? What do you think is the biggest hurdle for you? I think uh, one of the biggest hurdles for me was working so hard and not being able to enjoy that mm -hmm. money at the time, or we made the decision not to. Um, and so uh, we worked five jobs between um, the two of us on our journey. And I tell people, you know, in our first first year of doing side hustles, we made sixty six thousand um, dollars. So this was in 2018. Uh, sixty six thousand dollars in side hustle money before tax. And so that's a lot of money to not yeah, even touch one penny. Right. We didn't touch one penny of it. Like we tied off of it and then the rest of it went towards debt payments. But to work, you know, so much mm -hmm. and make the decision like not to touch any of it for us, that was one of the hard th hardest things that um, we had to do. And then also um, learning to say no <laughs> and uh, the power of saying no. So not only to ourselves, but to others and to things. And so um, one thing that I learned along my journey was every time you say yes to something that you want, but you don't really need, you're simultaneously saying no to something else. Mm -hmm. So if we said yes to, um, I don't know, saying yes to going out to eat um, every, every weekend, <laughs> mm -hmm. then we're saying no to something else. We're saying no to one of our goals, basically. Mm. Um, so that's one of the things that I had to learn and, you know, you know, no is a complete sentence. And so that's, <laughs> that's on the way. Yeah, that, no, that's, those are great points. You made a comment earlier, right? When you talked about um, how, how these companies have their data and they do their research. And I think that, uh, you know, something that, that Faith said when you talk about what others are doing, right? So what, what came to mind was <clears throat> we're constantly being marketed to, right? Oh, yeah. So even the idea of what it means to be wealthy, I think we're kind of sold a lie. Oh, um, okay. since we're, since we're kids, we're told that, you know, wealth looks a certain way, or mm -hmm. you have to have these trinkets or these things, not understanding that true wealth is your time. Um, oh, yeah. okay. so it's like, it's like an uphill battle for what you guys are doing too, because, you know, you know, that these are the right ways to do, you shouldn't be carrying this debt. This should be paid off. But then when someone, you know, finishes talking to you, they cut their TV on it and they, or, or they go on Instagram and then bombarded with these images and messages yeah. of these things. Right. So that mindset um, shift has, has got to be uh, serious, but I know it's, it's one of those things where you got to deal with it forever. Like you, you know, what's right. And you have to deal with all these uh, other images and things coming at you, but they're not going to stop. They're right. not going to stop. Oh yeah, never. And I actually have a picture and it's so funny that you said what you said. I have a quote that I got from someone and I screenshotted it and I want to read it real quick. Mm -hmm. um, 
It says, when your wealth gives both income and completely frees up your time, that is financial independence. Yep. I thought that was powerful right there. It's like that yep. time freedom. Yeah. It's, yep. not yep. it's not the accumulation of things. It's, you know, having options and having your time, mm -hmm. time back. And a lot of us don't have that time back. And I tell people all this is like, you work too hard to be struggling all the time. So for many people, it's not that they don't work hard. Mm -hmm. It's that hard work is not enough to get you where you need to be. Like you need to be strategic. You need to be making smart money decisions. So I know a lot of people who go to work 40, uh, 40 hours a week, uh, five days a week, every week, throughout the year. Mm -hmm. So it's not that they're not working hard, but you got to make some different decisions. Mm -hmm. um, so, And that's a great point, though, because I'm of the opinion that um, even with the idea of hard work, the way we've been sold hard work is crazy because it's about smart work. It's about you can do a lot of hard work, but if you're not working smart, it doesn't matter how yeah. hard you work. Hard work, yeah. hard work alone won't get you anywhere, right. you know, exactly. and not, not trying to be too over the top, but slaves worked hard, you know, like, yeah. you, know, you know what I mean? That's a fact. So, um, Man, I, I love you guys' story because I, I think it's so powerful in terms of what you're doing. Um, you're showing people that it's done. And one of the posts that I love the most was um, because when people talk about having um, all this debt sitting on their shoulders, they feel like they have to make. And you guys talked about the sacrifices you made, but they feel like they have to sacrifice everything. Like, yeah. I don't want to go through that journey because I know once I start that journey, I'm not even going to be able to do anything. Right. Right. And you guys had you guys had a post about the different places you've traveled while you paid your debt off. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I think that's powerful because it's like, okay, you know, we're, we're going through this, but, you know, we're not completely depriving ourselves of life, you know? Yeah, so, you know, you're definitely right. Yes, talk yeah. about that a little bit. Talk about why you shared that for one and for two, like, you know, um, the fact that you still can do things. Yeah, so I think it comes down to having a solid budget as well and coming up with a plan. So yeah. um, we had our budget, very strict budget, um, but we decided that there are some things that we did not want to sacrifice. And that would that was traveling for us. So we had an account where every single month we put money into that account so that when it came time to travel, we did not have to go in debt right. more for traveling. Um, and so when we were on our debt free journey, I mean, where have we been? I don't know, Paris and Greece, Greece and, and Spain, Spain. And Costa <laughs> yeah. Rica, yeah. Chicago, Florida. We Austin, just went, yes. we just went to Myrtle Beach. Um, I, yeah. I, I think, I think that's important to share. I really think that's important yeah. to share because a lot of times people don't start the journey because they're afraid. But like you said, it's proper planning, right? Right. right. We plan for everything else. So why not make a plan for your money? And we don't believe in depriving yourself. That's mm -hmm. a quick way to not succeed. Mm -hmm. And so that's not sustainable. If you're going to deprive yourself and, you know, uh, eat beans and rice, rice and beans and all this other stuff and noodles, <laughs> and all that stuff, it's not sustainable. It may, yeah. it may do good for a few months, but it's not sustainable. So what we tell people is to pick one to two things that you absolutely cannot live without because we believe in, you know, mental health, taking care of your mental health. Um, we believe in self-care, so do it in moderation, but pick that one or two things that you absolutely cannot live without and then sacrifice everything else. And it was funny because we pack our lunch for work. So we're debt free. We've been debt free for like 10 months now and outside of our mortgage. And so we pack our lunch to work. And it's funny because at my job, uh, they order, out, I think, every Friday, almost every Friday, like the entire um, clinic orders out. And I always say no. They always ask me, and I appreciate that, but I always say <laughs> no. And it's funny because, you know, uh, we went to Myrtle Beach for Labor Day and they asked me if I wanted to eat out and I said no. And then one person, one coworker was like, yeah, whatever. And then I was like, yeah, me saying no to you all of those times allowed me to go to Myrtle Beach. Mm -hmm. So that's where it goes back to like, when I say yes to something, I'm saying no to something else. And when right. I say no to something, I'm saying yes to something else. And mm -hmm. financial freedom is what I'm saying yes to a majority of the time. Yep. Mm, I love that. I love that. That's awesome. That's awesome. So what's the future for you guys? Like in terms of what you're building and helping others, um, you know, now now you you are debt free, um, you know, and you're building up your wealth. What does the future look like for you guys and, and your mission? Um, so for us is we want to be financially independent and not necessarily the retire early part because we love what we do for our nine to fives. Um, but being in a position where we can have more options and being in a position where we can have more time. And um, the first phase of that is getting faith 
down from five days a week to less days Yay. per week. So, that's what, <laughs> yeah. so, you know, we were working five jobs during our debt free journey. But as soon as we paid off that last debt, Faith no longer had to work her side hustles. Yep. And so that was part of getting her time back. Um, and so I'm still doing some of my side hustles. Um, but part of that is, you know, working less. And, you know, we will we will accomplish that by um, making our money work for us. So while it was paying off debt uh, for the past two and a half years, now we're investing all of that debt money. So we're not increasing our lifestyle because that's what most people do when they get an increase in income, which it was for us. When you pay off your debt, it's an increase in income. All of that, all of those minimum payments can now stay in your pocket, which is one of the lovely things about becoming debt free. But now we want that money to work for us. So we're um, investing it and giving it so we can have more time for it to grow and compound so that we where we um, so that we can be where we want to be in the next 10 years. So we're using I know, you know, people have canceled 2020, but we're still crushing our goals in 2020. And a big part of that is because we're debt free. Right. And so by the end of this decade, um, hopefully before we we hope to be millionaires, God willing, if we're still around um, and we're taking anybody who wants to come along with us, we're taking them with us. So yep. yeah, that's that's awesome. good, yeah. yeah, that's, that's amazing. That's amazing. So, um, we ask every guest that comes on to give us a book or something that inspired you along the way. Um, it could be a finance book. It doesn't have to be a fine. It could be anything. Um, or, you know, but you can, there has to be one book either. Give us a couple books that you guys like that, uh, you think helped you along this journey. So for me, like I mentioned before, is that I had a really hard time, like not idolizing other people's lives during the journey. Mm -hmm. um, so one book that really, really helped open up my eyes to that is this book called Love Your Life, Not Theirs by Rachel Cruz. Um, and that book helped me realize that, like, stop paying attention to what other people are doing, like other people. I mean, don't they, yeah, don't stop paying mm -hmm. attention with them. So focus on your goals, focus on the things that you have planned to do and love your life and not anybody else's. So that book has helped me tremendously. So I definitely recommend checking that out if you are struggling like I was. I said, I never heard that one. I got to check that out myself. Love your life. Yeah. Okay. Not theirs. How about, how about you, Leo? Any books that uh, come to mind for yeah. you? I have a couple of books. So one of my favorite books uh, with personal finance is The Millionaire Next Door uh, by Thomas Stanley. Yep. And that book basically just, you know, talks about, you know, how wealthy people are per, um, portrayed in media on TV and all this stuff is not really how it is in real life. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, they don't they drive used cars, for example, is one is one that really stuck out to me is that, you know, they're not driving, you know, the newest model. Um, so but that's what's portrayed in TV on TV. Right. And so uh, it really helped shift my mindset in terms of like um, what real wealth is. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's one of the books is by Thomas Stanley, I think William Danko. And then another book, um, especially for entrepreneurs. Uh, since we started this business is The Go-Giver. And I forget the author's name, but it's called The Go-Giver. And it's essentially talking about um, you providing more value than what you receive in payment. Yeah. And so we really prided ourselves, especially in our coaching business, on doing just that, providing more value than we could ever take in payment. And so that book just talks about um, giving. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so keeping open hands and then, you know, everything will circle back around. Uh, so that those are the two books. Oh, man. That's, those that's that's three great books right there. That's yeah. three great choices. <laughs> Listen, um, you guys are amazing. Um, and I love your story. I love the fact that you're helping others. And I think it's very important to highlight, uh, you know, um, people that look like us that are that are taking these steps. Right. Because debt is killing our community <laughs> even more so than anyone else. Right. We're right. paying off. So much. We're, we're giving away so much wealth, which is why that statement really right. resonated with me about, you know, your debt being passive income to someone else. And here's so, another um, one. Here's another mm -hmm. one. Modern day slaves are not in chains. Mm -hmm. They're in debt. Yeah. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Right. Um, you, you know, free. you can go back and read, um, you know, uh, books in, in, in the eight, like, you know, the early uh, 1800s. And it was actually written. Um, I forgot who it was. Someone wrote about it. Like, you know, Debt is, is, is slavery. Debt is slavery. Yeah. When you owe someone like that, that's literally because you talked about it earlier, how 
you looked at it and says, I'm going to be giving away my time for someone else. You're literally giving away your time to get this income to pay someone else. Yeah. So I think it's very important, but I think it's important for our community to have honest conversations about debt. Mm -hmm. um, because again, when I talk to people about debt, they get so like offensive and they, you know, they want to tell me all these different like complex strategies, mm -hmm. which are fine if right. you have the discipline, but right. data shows us most people just don't have that discipline. Yeah. Most people don't have that discipline and even within real estate. So I'm a real estate guy. Um, I've, I've worked in real estate my entire life. And one story I'll share with you guys and my audience has probably heard me say this before, but at, at the height, I own close to 60 properties. Right. Wow. And I scaled down since then, but I make more money owning less property because at, what I didn't realize at the time was I was scaling up so fast. I was carrying so much debt. Wow. But by by getting rid of those properties, I own I own probably less than I, I have to count my doors at this point, but I'm somewhere around 15 to 16 doors as opposed to 60. Right. right. And I'm making, I, but I'm making about three times more money wow. because out of all the property I own, I only have like two mortgages. Right. That's it. So. Right. But I, I pointed out to say that I realized that how powerful debt is because I can own, you know, uh, one fourth of what I did and still make more money. Right, because right. of just because I'm paying so much debt, right? You know? right, right. Yeah. Cool. So, so, cool. Uh, but I think it's important for us to have these honest conversations because even if you're not a real estate investor, if you're someone that just works a nine to five, if you're taking a huge portion of your check to pay other people's, like, you know, it's 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 kind of common sense, but it's not because people just people look at the minimum payments. Oh, I can afford oh, that. Oh, yeah, that's a huge. You, know? you take minimum payment your life away, but that's what that's what the industry wants you to focus on, right? So can they you afford want to it? On, yeah, you can afford the minimum payment, but you can't afford that loan. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? And so yep. a lot of people focus on, you know, they go to a car dealership and they're like, you know, one of the first questions they'll ask is, you know, how much can you afford? And you're trying to, you know, fit in $300 into it, but you're not looking at the big picture with, you know, interest, how long it's going to take you and all that stuff. So, right. and most, yeah, and even go ahead, go ahead. No, I was going to say, even, even with mortgages, I see people apply for a mortgage and the mortgage company says, hey, well, you're approved for this much. And I always say, well, take a step back. Like, you know, take a step back. Just because you can afford that much house doesn't mean you should be purchasing that much house. You know, wow. you're going to have taxes. You're going to have insurance. You're going to have all these things. And, yeah. you know, uh, do you want all that debt? And that's not their job to to see if you can afford it either. Right. Like, they'll look at your debt to income ratio, but then that doesn't account for everything else that you have to um, pay for. And so it's not their job to tell you, like, oh, you know, make sure that you're making a wise decision. When it comes to they just want to make sure they're getting their money at the end of the day. And so that's the same thing with like, you know, credit scores. You know, if you have a certain credit score, you'll probably have a higher interest rate and all that stuff. They just want their money at the end of the day. It's not their job to make sure that you're making a wise decision that you actually can afford a four hundred thousand dollar house. But then you end up cash poor. Right. You can't. I know, yeah. you know people who are taking like a few years to furnish their home because they bought too much home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's, you Ooh. put up something that's interesting, right? You put up credit scores, right? So that's another one that I that I run into personally, is people telling me these different strategies, and they're carrying this crazy debt because they're trying to figure out how to increase their score. And I mm. ask them, "What are you increasing your score for?" And a lot of times, it's because they just want a higher score. I'm like, "You're not buying a house, you're not right. buying anything. Why are you increasing your score?" And they try to play these games, and by playing these games, they're carrying debt, um, because they want this higher score. When to me is about what you owe, not necessarily what your score is. Like, right. what's your opinion of that? Like, people trying to just get this maximize their score for whatever reason. Um, I think that's just you know what they know. So they know credit scores, and I think society pushes that because you need that in order to borrow money, right? And so the credit score has been like this thing that has been placed in front of us as you know this magical number that is probably the most important financial number you need to know and so we've bought into that lie but all that does is allows us to get into debt right, right. and so while credit scores are important i think we should be focusing more on our net worth and what that number is and leave the credit score for if you are um in the process of getting something that you need the credit score for like a mortgage and all that stuff but um, we've placed too much emphasis on it to our detriment mm -hmm. and so a lot of times we're, we're focused on the credit score to get into more debt when we haven't focused on the proper things or haven't put the proper things in place and you know most financial problems are 
you know, behavioral. They're not really mathematical, they're behavioral. And so if you haven't owned in on the mindset, owned in on the behavior, then, you know, all of these strategies, they sound good. Uh, I know I know tons of different strategies that people are using, but um, they're not going to serve you any good if you don't have the behavior and the discipline to be able to, you know, manage your money well. Man, amazing points, amazing points. Listen, you guys, um, I could talk to you guys forever because I, lo I love your message, love what you're doing. But I just want to say um, thank you for your time, for one. This has been a, a, an amazing talk, an amazing interview. Um, and continue to do what you do. Um, if someone's out there watching and they just want to get started in terms of their debt journey, what would be the first piece of advice you would give them? Um, I would say the first piece of advice is to figure out your why. So instead of like focusing on money and budgeting and all this stuff, like figure out what your goal is and come up with a solid goal, solid motivation for you. Because there's many times like on our journey where we lost motivation, where we did not want to continue. Like there's been a lot of tears that were shed. Um, but the thing that kept us going is figuring out our why um, and always looking at that to help us keep going and provide that motivation. So that would be, for me, what I would say. Yeah. And then mindset. Yeah. yeah. I would say just start. Um, you know, an object in motion stays in motion, right? And so, you know, put one foot in front of the other. Um, and then forward is forward. So mm -hmm. as long as you're heading in the right direction, you're taking the necessary steps, yep. ask for help if you need help, um, because we get into this point where, you know, we don't reach out until we're, you know, in rock bottom right. a lot of the times. And so if you realize that you're not where you should be or where you would like to be, um, reach out to somebody who's doing what you want to do or mm -hmm. who's been where you want want to be one day and ask for help. Um, and so, especially with the money stigma and all that stuff, right. um, people are afraid to ask for help and uh, they get left behind, you know, bills start to rack up, get into collections and all this stuff. And, you know, you know, just a, accountability may have been all they needed. Um, mm -hmm. But because they were afraid to voice that, um, they didn't get the help that they needed. And so I would say, you know, just start is one mm -hmm. for me. And then, um, you know, ask for help if you need it. Yeah. And I also want to say this too, is that so a lot of people do get really motivated by our story and the fact that we paid off so much debt in like two and a half years. But there are some people on the other end as well that almost like get discouraged, I guess. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, well, I don't make that much money. So there's no way that I'm ever able to pay off all of my debt. And so for those people, I, I want you to know that your journey like does not have to look like ours. Right. Like you don't have to pay off all this debt in two and a half years, like definitely not the case. Um, but for you, it's like really important to just start, like ask for help. Like Leo was saying, come up with a solid plan, come up with a solid budget. And no matter how long it takes you, like you can still do it. Like don't get discouraged yeah. and think that you have to, or that you don't make that much money or you don't worry that you can't pay off the debt in two and a half years. Like, don't get discouraged. Just just start the process. Yeah. And that's all mindset right there. So if the way that you speak to yourself and those negative thoughts, you automatically shut your brain down to um, opportunities. Mm -hmm. And so you just definitely want to, you know, watch what you say and how you say certain things, because that will affect how you feel and how you feel will affect what you actually do. And so we definitely encourage people to, you know, shift their mindset when it comes mm -hmm. to all of this stuff. Like debt does not have to be normal for you. Yeah. So I don't know who taught you that you have to pay somebody, <laughs> else to life, right. but we need to unlearn that. Like we have to Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Listen, uh, uh, Faith and Leo, I just want to say thank you um, for the folks out there uh, watching or listening. I'll make sure to put all of their um, social media contacts within the description. Please make take a look and see what they got going on. Um, you know, get your freedom meter uh, and, and, you know, just uh, give them some feedback and let them know what you think about their story, because I personally think that is awesome. Um, I'm happy to share this uh, with, with our audience, because um, as we focus on building wealth, um, buying assets, we also need to focus on uh, not becoming someone else's passive income, you know, as, as, as Leo stated. I think that's amazing. So I just want to say thank you, guys. I really appreciate you. you continue to share your story. Um, and anything you need on our end, we definitely want to help support you guys. And I just want to say appreciate you for giving us your time. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank so you for sharing for your platform. Us. Yeah, thank you. And keep doing the work that Absolutely. you're doing. Our culture needs it. Thank you.
I actually appreciate that. Appreciate that much. And for the folks out there watching, make sure you share this episode. Hit the like button. Um, get, leave us some feedback. Give us some comments. Um, and check out what they got going on. Um, we want to continue to highlight people who are doing positive work in our community because that's very important. Representation matters. Uh, so we'll continue to do so. And as we always say, it's not about how much money you make. It's about how much you keep. Game elevates and we shall see you on the next episode. Peace. Yeah.